welcome to Her Business, where we interview inspiring businesswomen and entrepreneurs. I'm Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network. My guest today is known by many as the branding diva. Karen Post is an international branding expert, professional speaker, and author of Brand Turnaround, How Brands Gone Bad Returned to Glory. In this interview, we look at the seven steps to take when your brand is in trouble. A quick test to see if you look too much like your competition. How to build brand equity so that clients stay loyal. And why taking responsibility when things go wrong does not mean claiming you're guilty. Enjoy this interview with Karen Post. Karen, hi and welcome to the program. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to talking about your new book, Brand Turnaround. So let's go ahead and have you tell us how the book came about. Well, about 18 months ago, I got a call from CNN and they were doing a story on a pharmaceutical company that was recalling a lot of products and they wanted my opinion on when bad things like this happen to good companies, how it impacted the brand. So I uh, answered the question in brief. She was on a deadline. And the more I started thinking about it, I got very curious about why certain companies and individuals were able to turn around and others crashed and burned. So that was uh, how the, the book idea got started. We're going to have a look at uh, some of the things that we can do when things do go wrong. And I know you'll give us a couple of examples of companies that we may recognize. But before we go into it, could you define for us, you know, what is it that they're turning around? Define brand from your perspective. Absolutely. A brand is the sum of what a business entity or a nonprofit organization or even an individual puts out to the world every single day. And the the term brand, I believe, has evolved. 20 years ago when we heard that word, we thought it was a name or a slogan. But I really believe it's the sum of every touch point. So as a professional like you and I are, uh, how we answer our phone, how we conduct business, keep our promises – all of our visual touch points, our website, our business card, everything that you do either adds to the brand that you would like, the impression that you would like the public um, to feel, think, and expect from you, or it takes away from it when you start doing things that um, are inconsistent with uh, who you want to be in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So a brand is applicable to a big business with thousands of employees or an individual uh, consultant uh, or even a professional that may work for an organization. So when brands do, for whatever reason, and we'll look some of those uh, reasons in a moment, go bad, what are some of the situations that we that cause that now a lot of us aren't a bp or we're not an airline so we're not having that sort of brand gone bad experience but what are some of the other situations that we find ourselves well, in well unfortunately there are many things that can shake up a brand um it can be something that uh, if you have a small business that one of your employees did that you had no control over that could negatively impact your organization You could produce a product that for some reason your customers were upset with. And now with social media, within the matter of minutes, whether you're a big organization or a small one, there could be a lot of hostility um, everywhere. Uh, You know, depending on what kind of business you are, um, if you are suddenly under investigation for something, whether it's a government organization Mm. or a trade association that could shake up a brand, accidents happen. Um to the best business owners and best business leaders, and no one's really immune to that. You could have a shift in your market. Um, You know, people that made fax machines a few years ago had a great business. Well, now a fax machine is a dinosaur. So suddenly all of those companies found themselves um, in a really bad situation and they need to turn around. So when I refer to turn around, it's really any negative force that impacts your ability to do and run your business. Now, in the book, you give us seven what you call game changers that time and again have worked to get people out of a hole. Um, And the first one of these is take responsibility. And what I wanted to do is have you clarify that because are you saying that we go, we're guilty, 
Is that where we start with taking responsibility? No, that's not what I mean. When when I say take responsibility, I I am asking and suggesting that, that you show up, that you acknowledge to your markets, your employees, your customers, your vendors, that you are aware and on top of the situation and that your goal is to get answers because you share the same concerns that the public does. But many times things will happen to a business, small business or large business, and the the main leaders, they just go run in a closet or they say no comment. Right. And I just think that that's not um, a road forward to recovery, no matter how the facts unfold. So I think by showing up, by just saying we're aware of the situation, we don't have all the facts, we're looking into it, but you just acknowledge that you're there uh, is worth a lot. And then if you mess up, uh, then you need to say, you need to apologize. Apologies go a long way. Consumers are generally forgiving, uh, but sometimes it means saying I'm sorry. I know there's been situations. I've I've been in business since I was 26 years old, where something happens and perhaps it's you feel like it's not your fault. But um, there's really it, when the customer has a complaint or has had an experience, you know that just sometimes just saying I hear you and I'm doing something about it uh, is more important than anything I, I've found. It is and it's also important to not start pointing fingers mm. and um, creating a blame game because that really doesn't solve the problem. Your focus needs to be on solving the problem and often when these brand meltdowns happen there's a lot of emotion that's involved and and that would be many of our first reaction is to point the finger to right. someone else but you know ultimately even if it was one of your employees like um, the tragic uh, ship accident in right. Italy a couple weeks ago you know it's it sounds like based on what we know that the captain was at fault but ultimately the company that hired that captain you know has to share responsibility because they put that guy in that place so you just need to be sensitive acknowledge that you're working on it don't point fingers and just be focused on finding solutions sometimes when things happen we can as you said we just want to run and hide and yet you invite us to find stamina inner strength and the will to come back when we've been knocked down can you tell us a bit about that you know the finding or finding your deep will uh, is so important because if you don't they will your customers will soon be writing your will as if you just, <laughs> as if you bit the dust um, yeah and you know and if, if you look through history um, so many people that I know we all admire individuals and and companies that were really faced with huge obstacles um, and, and instead of throwing in the towel, um, they developed a plan, they worked it every day, and, you know, time heals a lot of things. Like many of the cases in, in my book uh, talk about high-profile professionals and bad things that either they created or that happened to them, and and time is, is a good friend, and so you just need to... Um, find the strength and, and work your plan and continue to stay focused on what your goals are. The role of the leader, uh, which in many cases is, you know, the business owner or the CEO um, in this difficult time is obviously important. Um, but what takes, what steps, excuse me, should a leader take when they are required to step up? How do they approach it? Well, I, I believe that the role of, for instance, the chief executive officer or the owner of your company, if you're a small business, does expand at the time of crisis because you've not only got to keep your eye on the operations and the day-to-day -day business, but in fact, you become um, a bit of a chief emotions officer. And, you know, part of your role is to keep your team motivated and and full of um, bright things in the future and reframing the uncertainty that everyone may be feeling. So a compassionate leader, uh, I believe, is an important quality to have. And then again, if you look at some of the companies that I chronicle in the book, you'll find leaders that um, are not textbook traditional leaders. They have strong individual personalities and they 
embrace those personalities and they really use them and leverage them as they're um, building the recovery. Um, you know, so I think that's exciting for entrepreneurs knowing that every leader does not need to look like uh, they came from an Ivy League school and they have an MBA and they're a certain kind of person. It's really a balance of vision and compassion and problem solving and being a really good communicator. Uh, you mentioned BP earlier. And, and while they obviously are a really large company, um, I think what we all of us learned is, is that the person in front of the camera needs to be the right person. So say if you have a small business and something bad happens and you're not really good in front of the camera, you need to recognize that and find someone else to step in and, and deal with that public line, whether um, it's an advisor or an attorney or someone else that you trust, because that first point of communication can be very damaging, as we all saw with uh, Tony Hayward and BP, that he was not the right personality for that situation, and it was very damaging. Mm. Well, what I'd love to do at this point then is give our listeners an example of a leader who that I really admire, and that's Howard Schultz of Starbucks. Tell us, for instance, in contrast, um, the example that you give in the book about his leadership at a time where Starbucks was in a bit of a hole. Well, you know, he left the company and um, and then, but still served on the board and kept an eye on what was going on. And apparently, in addition to the numbers falling, customer satisfaction and just the love of the brand was uh, really starting to deteriorate. So when he jumped in, um, you know, he rolled up his sleeves and, and he went right to the core of what built the Starbucks brand, which was all about the customer experience. And, you know, that seems like an obvious place to go, but sometimes as organizations grow and get really large, they lose touch with the reason that they are in business is to deliver wonderful experiences to the customer. So I think that was a big turning point for him. And then some of his um, values from coming from a middle class family and the importance of benefits for employees, as he became a powerful leader, he never lost sight of those. And I think he's viewed today as a very compassionate leader that um, is also sensitive to the employees needs as you're growing an organization and turning around a brand. So I, I think Howard is a, is a great example of good leadership. One of the um, chapters that for me, you know, I did a bit of a double take and reread it, was the one about staying relevant because you make a big point of saying don't try to please everyone. Um, tell us who we should be relevant to. Is it the customer or prospect or employer? Is it our st staff? Who is the it's a mix because um, as business owners and entrepreneur, uh, we don't just have one market. We have certainly the consumer that buys our product. And even if you're in a B2B space, uh, when I use the word consumer, I mean anyone who, who buys what we're selling. But equally important um, are your troops and, and your employees. So on all situations, and whenever you have a brand, you have your external brand and then you have your internal brand. And it's just so important to be relevant to the consumer of that um, piece of your brand. And often, you know, companies start and then they grow and then they get so busy and they, they lose sight of what's really important to the customer. And, and you've got to, as you're doing a turnaround, you need to look at your offering, your product, your services, a little bit like the cycle of fashion. Now, there's some categories that are timeless and, and don't move a lot, but just the look and feel of your marketing materials, what that says about your brand. If you've not looked at them in a while, you know, today they may look out of date, like wearing an outfit that's out of style. And so by being relevant, you're not only talking about delivering on promises, but are you reflecting who you are through your, your look and feel and your communications? And as you mentioned earlier today, there are so many more ways that we communicate. Oh, there are so many with social media. Mm. I mean, even what you're Twitter profile looks like, whether you're on LinkedIn, all of those things, especially for a small business owner, 
are, are huge pieces of the puzzle that make up your brand. So I recommend that, you know, annually at the end of the year, that's the time that I do it. I look at all my touch points and, and I ask myself the hard questions. Does this need to be freshened up? Does it feel like it's current and contemporary? Or do maybe I need to reach out and speak to my markets and find out what's important to them? But being relevant is just making sure that you're not just running your business to make to make your numbers and your goals, but that you are absolutely meaning something to your consumers and that they see what's in it for them. So staying on the subject of that ongoing improvement and keep improving is one of your game changers. What are some of the questions uh, we can ask ourselves to get started on that road of innovation and, and growth? And you've just said looking at your touch points, checking whether they're relevant. Is there anything else? You know, um, I believe all brands are a work in progress. Um, I, I don't think there's one brand that any of us could name that is exactly the same as when it started. Um, so knowing that things change constantly, you know, you need to look at how social values have changed. Um, like in the past few years, the environment and being a friend of the environment, that's that's really um, surfaced with a lot of consumers. So you may want to look at some areas there. Are you... Um, are you covered in that area uh, with technology constantly changing? Are you um, innovative and leveraging the best technology that you can? And even your processes and, and how you do business or how people reach out to you. You know, it amazes me how many big websites I go to from big companies and I love what they're selling. And then I try to find the, how I can contact them and you can't find it on their site. So something as simple as how can consumers and buyers of your products connect with you and engage with you and are all those processes easy and enjoyable? So those are just a few areas that you can look at. I want to talk about the subject of equity in a brand and we recently saw Kodak, a brand that many of us have grown up with and which I think had great brand equity, um, so many memories tied with it. But when it comes to perhaps a smaller business, what is brand equity and, and how do we build it? Well, earlier when I you asked me to define what a brand is, I said it's the sum of everything that you do. So I, I look at brand equity as a bank account. And every time you do something stellar, a great piece of work, you solidify a wonderful relationship, you push out a new product, um, you connect with your customers and they love you, you get deposits for all of those things. So you want to keep your balance high because history has proven again and again that when businesses do stumble or individuals, the recovery process will be so much easier if you've got a lot of love built up versus if you are looking for love the day that you melt down. And what I mean by that is even something as simple as social media for people that, you know, well, it takes a lot of time to do that and I you know I don't really see any business from it right now but then should you need to respond to something say one of your products is recalled or you know there's a bad accident in your company you trying to scramble around and find people ambassadors and fans that you can assemble in one spot on the day of the crisis is is not going to be the way you want to do it you want to have the love there built so that when things do happen you almost have a teflon coating about <laughs> you and 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 it will bounce off and and you know i know there are international government leaders that have felt this and seen this you know there's some that continue to do silly things but they're so loved that people are more forgiving and i, I think the same concept really applies for all businesses so when i say build equity you want to do that with frequency of message, with um, the right message, and um, good experiences from all your touch points. And then you've got a high balance. And then should you need to tap into their support, it's already there. And you're not out, like I said, looking for love the day that you have a meltdown. When it comes to equity, you know, is it 
unfair then that the new kid on the block can't really have the sort of equity that someone who's been in business 10 years has had? Well, or, or does it you know, not work like it, that? It, it, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, it, you would think it would, but here's here's the, the ticket and, and game changer number seven is about owning your own distinction. So if you're a business, say if you're a, a consultant and you're really just like all the other consultants and there's nothing unique about you, everything is going to be harder to do and to achieve versus if you have a unique place that you are positioned among your competition and then you start building equity and building relationships, the process is just so much easier because you're given the marketplace something to hang on to, which are your points of distinction. So whether it's um, a name like, you know, I go by the branding diva. Uh, often people don't even remember my name is Karen Post because <laughs> I've coined that. And it's, you know, while it's a little silly, people remember it. And so you want to have a stable of unique assets about you, whether it's um, a coined word, whether it's a certain look that you have, whether, you know, you love black Labradors and, you know, and, and that black lab is on a lot of your materials, anything unique, it just makes it easier for people to remember you and to put you in a separate spot and hopefully a higher spot against your competitors. So that's why distinction is so important, uh, really, in, in the turnaround. And even if you never have to turn around, uh, being distinction makes your marketing dollars and all your efforts be so much more effective. So when you, in your book, you say standout brands play smarter, is it having those distinctions? Is that what oh, they do to play it smarter? Is, yes, because... Um, if you look like everyone else, often it comes down to price. And, and when you get in that game, often your margins are less and people are less loyal. They'll kick you to the curb faster than if there's something that they really like about you. Like, you know, while Apple Computer is a very big example of a company, their um, attention to incredible design and user interface has been uh, part of their distinction from the beginning. And if you ask any Apple computer user, why do you use an Apple versus a PC? Uh, I would bet that those two unique factors come up. And so being distinct is, is absolutely a game changer. One of the uh, points that I was reading on your website, and this is a little bit um, off topic, but still on branding. I think you said if you covered up the logo on your website, would people still know it was you? That's a great test. And anyone, everyone can I do it. I love that. Yeah. Because and the same I think thing most would fail. <laughs> yeah. And the same thing with your business card. If you're, you know, and, and I don't know in um, Australia, if you have a lot of pre-printed business cards that you can buy at office supplies and just kind of put your name on, those things make me crazy because you just are like everyone else and you're just confirming that there's nothing special about you. So is something simple as your website look, your business card, the shape of your business card, it needs to be unique and you need to stand out. And, and I think it's even more important when you're a small business because you may have less resources than the big, well-funded competitors. But, but taking that test um, is a great exercise. And if the listeners don't do anything else from this interview, I hope they do that. And if someone could be confused and think it's their competitor, then they've got some work to do. It certainly made me think, it's like, oh, you think, well, the logo's there. Of course people will know. But, you know, does it feel like us in every way? You know, so I think that's a wonderful, easy uh, quiz. And I found that, as I said, on brandingdiva.com. Just before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to leave us with, Karen? You know, um, while my book talks about big companies, I, I even talk about a former bank robber who spent seven years in jail and how he turned his life around. So the messages are really for small business and big business and, and even individuals. Um, 11 years ago, I 
did a startup that unfortunately had to be um, put on the History Channel. And it was very devastating. And I felt like my personal brand was at its all-time low. And I used many of the things that I talk about in the book to turn my personal brand around. And I can't say that it happened in five minutes. It was about five years before it really did the 360 but don't um don't give up um stick with it with the right plan and fresh thinking uh mission possible on on anyone's brand the book is brand turnaround how brands gone bad return to glory and the seven game changes that made the difference karen thank you so much for joining us it's great to be here thanks for having me Thanks for listening. I trust you enjoyed this interview with Karen Post. Learn more about Karen at brandingdiva.com and pick up your copy of Brand Turnaround at your local bookstore. I'm Susie Daphnis of the Australian Business Women's Network, a national provider of education and training for business women. If you're ready to be connected to inspiring women who are making a difference to the business landscape, ask us today about our membership programs. And for more interviews with inspiring women, visit our website at www.abn.org.au.